Okay, so we're recording and so yes, so uh, hello everyone. Thanks again for coming to the Non-Commutative Geometry and Topology Seminar. So today we have Jonathan Brown from the University of Dayton and he's going to be speaking about intermediate C star subalgebras of Cartan embeddings. Thank you, John. Uh, well, thank you, Tristan. Uh, I'd really like to um, thank you guys for inviting me to give this talk. I was just saying that it was, it's really fun to be able to um, give a talk to you all got, guys, even though we're in the middle of this pandemic and I'm in Ohio right now. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. And I, and so I appreciate this opportunity. I, I wanna also um, say that this um, talk was, was joint with uh, Rui, um, Adam, David, and Sarah. Um, Rui is in a, was visiting David in Nebraska while we were doing this. Um, Adam is at Ohio and Sarah is at uh, Kansas State. Um, we were supported by uh, the American um, Institute of Mathematics for part of this work. Um, David and Sarah both have Simons grants that they work on. And I forgot to include that Rui is uh, supported by the Brazilian government as well. So um, I, I, sh I should mention that. So uh, I'm going to start off and talk to you guys first about what is a carton embedding. So, oh, so let, let, I'm going to first tell you about what I'm doing, but we're going to start off with a little bit of a history on, on what the problem is, uh, some results that have uh, that have come before us, and um, also you know, one result from our paper. Then I'm going to uh, introduce you guys to groupoids because groupoids are a very um, are intimately connected to Carton embeddings, as you'll see. Um, and we'll talk about groupoid C star algebras as well, how to construct um, C star algebras from them. And then we're going to give a Galois correspondence um, between Carton embeddings and, um, and groupoids. And we'll get some consequences of these. So um, that's where we're heading. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a couple proofs along the way here. So let's start off with what a Carton inclusion is. So we're taking A to be a C star algebra um, and we're gonna take a maximal abelian subalgebra D of A and it's Carton if D contains an approximate identity for A. There is a faithful conditional expectation from A to D and there's this set of elements that we call normalizers. So there are elements of A such that if we conjugate uh, D by them, we end up back in D. Um, and we want that this closed span of these normalizers give us back A. So that's what it means to be Carton. Um, this is in the C star algebra setting. In the von Neumann algebra setting, the definition is essentially the same. So now, if in addition, every pure state of D extends uniquely to a pure state of A, then D is what's called diagonal. So I should mention that the Carton definition was given by Renault in 2008 paper, and this diagonal condition was given by Kumjin in his 86 paper on this. So just a couple of examples. So if G is a discrete group acting either freely or topologically freely um, on a locally compact house or space X, then C0 of X is a diagonal in C0 of X cross G, the reduced cross product there, if the action is free and it's Carton if the action is topologically free. So somehow um, in relation to group actions, this is a freeness type condition. And, um, one of the inspirations for this is actually given by the diagonal matrices. They are, the diagonal matrices are diagonal in the n by n matrices. Um, so our big question here is suppose we have uh, an inclusion D as a subset of a C star algebra A and D subset of A is Carton. And then we have some subalgebra between them. Is D, a, also Carton and B. Um, at first blush, this seems like this might be obvious. 
So D is certainly a massa in B because it's a massa in A. D certainly contains an approximate identity for B because it contains an approximate identity for A. There's certainly a conditional expectation from B to D. You just have to restrict the conditional expectation from A. But it isn't clear that the span of the normalizers in B give us back B. And so it's this last condition here that's really the hard one that uh, tells us that maybe something uh, more is going on for inclusions. So Adam you know, Fuller was the first one who brought this uh, uh, question to me. Um, and one of the reasons why he brought this question is there's some known results in von Neumann algebras about this. So let's talk about some of this. So the first one is sort of a classical uh, result. You know, what kind of the reason why people got into Carton inclusions in the first place? It's a Feldman and Moore result from '77 that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between measured equivalence relations R and Carton embeddings, where M is a von Neumann algebra, such that the um, von Neumann algebra of the relation is isomorphic to M. Um, so somehow um, Carton embeddings are all given by these measured equivalence relations. And the theorem that uh, Adam brought to my attention is that if M is a von Neumann algebra and D is a Carton subalgebra of M, and if uh, we have some intermediate um, von Neumann subalgebra of M, then there's a unique uh, faithful normal conditional expectation from M onto N and D is also Carton in N. So the, uh, this is a positive result. Um, so our question on the previous slide is positive if we're, if we're talking about uh, von Neumann algebras. But moreover, we can combine these two um, results to say that there's a correspondence between subrelations and intermediate subalgebras. So um, the uh, subset of N is going to, that's a Carton embedding. So the Feldman and Moore theorem is going to give us an equivalence relation, um, a measured equivalence relation uh, that we can construct. And then that measured equivalence relation is gonna necessarily be a subrelation. So there's some sort of Galois correspondence between subrelations and sub von Neumann subalgebras. Okay, so, but there's also some other results from the theory of cross products. Remember that um, if we have a cross product of uh, a billion C star algebra by a discrete group, we end up with a, a Carton subalgebra um, as long as the discrete group is acting uh, topologically freely. So maybe um, we could get some inspiration from cross product land. So there's a, a famous theorem by Izumi, Longo, and Popa that if N is a factor of von Neumann algebra and G is a discrete group acting freely on N, then there is this one to one correspondence between subgroups of G and intermediate von Neumann algebras between N and the cross product. So this is kind of the same idea um, that we were talking about with Carton embeddings, but we don't necessarily have a Carton embedding here because N is not necessarily a billion, and in fact, definitely not a billion. Inspired by this result, there were there was a series of papers, one by Choda, then uh, Izumi builds on that, and then finally Cameron Smith is giving the um, theorem as I'm mentioning here, that if we have a discrete group acting on a simple C star algebra by aut outer automorphism, so kind of like a free action, then the map H to um, A cross H is a one-to-one -one correspondence between subgroups of G and C star algebras B that are intermediate, okay? And also in there, this case, there is also a faithful conditional expectation from the cross product, the reduced cross product of G onto this intermediate subalgebra. So I'm pointing out a couple um, things here. Again, uh, we have this correspondence 
um, in a situation, but this is almost very different from what we're talking about because um, we're talking about a simple C star algebra where, of course, um, in Cartan embedding land, um, we are very far from simple. But we do get some sort of correspondence here. I, I should also mention that in all of these cases, we seem to have faithful conditional expectations onto the subalgebras coming for free. And in some cases, these faithful conditional expectations, I shouldn't say are coming for free because most of the time they're being used to prove uh, the results here. So this brings us to um, our first result here that, and this is from our paper, um, Suppose that we have D as a Cartan inclusion, and suppose that we have an intermediate um, subalgebra such that there's a faithful conditional expectation from A to B, then D subset of B is Cartan. And the basic idea of this proof is that if we take uh, a normalizer, um, because remember the normalizers are the things that we um, don't know about, uh, then we can get enough normalizers because if we take the faithful conditional expectation of that normalizer, that normalizer will end up in the normalizers of uh, D and B. So we are able to get enough uh, normalizers in this way um, to get a Cartan embedding. Now, you might ask, is that it? Our, in the previous results, we always had these faithful conditional expectations. Um, is, that, is that the case here? And the answer is no. We're not necessarily going to always have a faithful conditional expectation onto a, a subalgebra. And I'll give you results to that effect in a second. Um, so there will be lots of are potentially lots of intermediate subalgebras um, between D and A that do not come with this faithful conditional expectation, so we don't have everything we need uh, yet. But in order to talk more about this, um, we need to get into uh, the idea of a groupoid um, and use groupoid techniques to attack this problem. So, I'm going to start off with a few examples. Um, the first example is equivalence relations. If you recall, um, equivalence relations are kind of important here because if we talk about um, the Feldman and Moore result, we had in von Neumann algebras a, a relationship between Cartan embeddings and measured equivalence relations. So let's, let's say we have R as a subset of X cross X, which is an equivalence relation. We can use the relation R to describe an algebraic structure. So it's, it's just equivalence relation, it's transitive. So if I have X, Y in my relation and Y, Z in my relation, then X, Z is also in my relation. Um, and so I think of this transitivity and I've written it as a multiplication there, as a multiplication. And this is a partially defined multiplication because it's only defined when the middle bit here is the same element. So of course, equivalence relations are also reflexive, but X comma X is always in our relation. And that will give us something that acts as a unit. If I have X comma X times X, Y, just using the multiplication formula here, that gives me X, Y and X comma X times Y, Y is also X, Y. So I have potentially many different units. And so we call those the units of this relation and we relate them to X. And we also know that equivalence relations are symmetric. X comma Y is in the relation if and only if Y comma X is in the relation. And notice if we start multiplying these things together, X comma Y times Y comma X is equal to X comma X. And so, these things act as inverses of each other. And so our equivalence relations, when we're starting to talk about this algebraic structure, always have inverses. 
So we have this partially defined multiplication with some units and inverses when we think of the relation as an algebraic structure. And moreover, if X has a topology, then R has the subspace topology and multiplication and inversion are continuous in this topology. Yeah. Um, I also should mention that each X and Y have a range in source. I'm gonna call the source of X, Y as Y, and I can relate that to Y comma Y, the unit and the range of X comma Y is X, and we will relate that to the unit X comma X. And so I kind of think of X comma Y as a map that takes Y to X. Okay, so here's another important example, and we've talked about these in terms of Carton subalgebras as well. So suppose I have a countable discrete group H that acts continuously on the left of a topological space X. Then we can use the algebraic structure of H to define an algebraic structure on H cross X. So a multiplication here is G comma X times H comma G inverse acting on X um, is equal to GH comma X. So notice that this is also a partially defined multiplication and we're using the group multiplication to help us out there. Now, if I take the unit in H comma X and I multiply that by G comma X, I get GX. And similarly, if I do it on the right-hand side. So we have units again, one for each element of X. And again, we can have an inverse G comma X times G inverse comma G inverse comma times X is equal to E X. So if you just work out what the multiplication is, you get that uh, we get the one of our units. So everything has an inverse. And we can give H cross X, the product topology and multiplication will of course be continuous in that topology. We also have that each element has a range in source. The source of G comma X is G inverse times X. The range of G comma X is X. And I can think of G comma X as a map that takes G inverse X to X. And so this is a map that is incorporating our action of H on X. Okay, so both of those are the important examples of groupoids that we're gonna be dealing with. Um, and I have highlighted uh, the aspects of those examples that give a groupoid structure. So if you just want to think about equivalence relations or uh, group actions throughout the rest of this talk, feel free to think about those anytime I talk about groupoids. So a topological groupoid G is a set with a topology, and I'm always going to consider a second countable locally compact Hausdorff and Atal. We can relax second countable a little bit if we want to. Um, and I'm going to, and it's going to have a partially defined continuous multiplication. And it's going to have units, which I'm going to denote G upper zero. And inverses, every element will have an inverse. Okay. So, in addition, there are range and source maps. Um, well, the range and source maps take a groupoid element to the units. And I think of each element of the groupoid as mapping the source of that element to the range of that element. Okay, so we need uh, two important definitions about groupoids here. A groupoid is topologically principal if the set of units such that the things that have that range and the intersect the things that have that source is just the unit itself, okay? So if I look at that set, what I'm really saying is these are the elements of my groupoid that have the same range and source. And what this is saying is that there aren't very many of them, okay? So, the set of things where there's only one element that has the same range in source is dense in the unit space. And if H is a group acting topologically freely on X, then H cross X is a topologically principal groupoid. 
groupoid is principal if there is only ever one thing that maps um, a particular range to a particular source, and that is the unit itself. And so we're going to call so some things that have this property, if R is an equivalence relation, then R is principal. And in fact, every principal group would can be thought of as an equivalence relation. So if you just want to think about equivalence relations when we're talking about principal group voids, please, please do. Um, but you can also think about uh, a group acting freely on X, then H cross X is um, a principal group void as well. Okay, so this is a operator algebra's talk. So we do want to construct C star algebras from these things. And I'm going to assume my group voids are second countable house, Dorf, and et al. I am not going to define et al here um, because it's not going to be that important, except that it, it's what makes the following formulas work. Okay. So these um, assumptions are going to allow us to define C star algebras, starting with the continuous compactly supported functions on the groupoid. Um, we can define a convolution multiplication, F star G of gamma is equal to the sum of range of gamma is equal to the range of eta, F eta, G of eta inverse gamma. And we can take an involution, F star gamma is equal to the um, complex conjugate of F of gamma inverse. Yeah. And we can then define a left regular representation on um, little L2 of the set of groupoid elements that have a particular source. And we're just going to take um, one for each unit. And essentially, we're just doing convolution again. And the point is that the reduced groupoid C star algebra is the completion of the continuous um, compactly supported functions on G in the induced norm. Okay. So one example is if we take X to be a finite set and R to be the full equivalence relation, so X cross X, then C star of R is isomorphic to the N by N matrices. And the unit space here, we can identify with X. And so C0 of X is identified with the diagonal matrices in this particular case. OK, so here are some facts that are going to be really important for us about um, C star R of G. So suppose that we have H, a subgroupoid of an atoll groupoid G. If H is open in G, then we can embed C star R of H into C, the reduced C star algebra of G. I proved this along with um, uh, Fuller, Pitts, and Resnikoff in an unpublished paper. Um, but this is something that's fairly well known among experts. So I happen to know that um, this uh, is proven in this paper, but um, people know about it. But in particular, G0 is an open subgroupoid of G. And so C0 of G0 it embeds nicely into C star R of G. Now, that is something that is well, well known from the very start of uh, the study of groupoid C star algebras. So now another theorem that is, I think, less well known is if H is clopin in G, if and only if there exists a conditional expectation from C star R of G into C star R of H. So this is in the um, paper uh, we're discussing today um, with uh, um, XL, Fuller, Pitts, and Resnikoff that's um, been recently been accepted. Um, but the main uh, idea of this comes from a paper with myself, Nagy, Resnikoff, Sims, and Williams, um, we just translated that um, argument over to uh, this more general setting. So this theorem here tells us that there are potentially lots of um, intermediate subalgebras 
that don't necessarily have faithful conditional expectations on them. Anytime we have an open subgroupoid that is not also closed, we don't necessarily get a faithful conditional expectation. So, but in particular, um, G0 is also closed in G, so there's a fa faithful conditional expectation from C star R of G onto C0 of the unit space. Oh, yeah. So Renault showed in his 2008 paper that C0 of G0 is Carton in C star R of G, if and only if G is topologically principal. No. And so if we're thinking about this, if I take C0, if I take the unit space and I have H a sub algebra, a subgroupoid of G that happens to be open, then I know that C0 of G0 is a um, subalgebra of C star H, which is a subalgebra of C star of G reduced. And since G is topologically principal, certainly H is also going to be topologically principal. So C0 of G0 embeds into C star R of H is Carton. So if I have an open subgroupoid um, of G, I necessarily get an intermediate Carton inclusion. So the question is, is this going to give us all of the inter intermediate Carton inclusions? And that's the main uh, impetus of the rest of this talk. So now um, let's talk about diagonal, that C0 of G0 is diagonal in C star R of G, if and only if G is principal. And that was proven by Kumjin in his initial paper in, from 86. So the last um, important bit that I want to mention here is a result by Renault from his thesis that if I have a, the setup we're having here, where we have an atoll um, group of second countable locally compact Hausdorff, then C star of the reduced, um, the reduced C star algebra of G embeds into C zero of G. And so there's a norm decreasing linear embedding. What this allows us to do and what's important for us is that we can view every element of the groupoid as a linear functional then on the groupoid C star algebra by taking epsilon sub gamma to really be evaluation. I can take a, a element of my groupoid C star algebra, map it using this embedding to C zero of G and then just a, just evaluate um, that element because pointwise evaluation makes sense in C0 of G. Okay, so you can kind of think about um, the groupoids elements as being linear functionals on C star R of G. So the last thing I wanna mention is a construction of Renault's that allows us to construct uh, groupoids from Carton embedding. So we saw in the previous slide that every um, topologically principal groupoid gives us a Carton embedding. Now, um, what about the other direction? So suppose I have a Carton subalgebra of a C star algebra A. And so we have a natural uh, uh, canonical uh, conditional expectation from A to D. And we have our normalizers. And notice that these normalizers act on D by taking D to the conjugate of D by the normalizer. Yeah, And this induces a partial action of uh, the normalizers on D hat. Notice also that if I have a normalizer that n n star and n n star, no, it should be n star n are both in D for all n that are normalizers. And basically um, 
all we have to do is conjugate the unit or a or a approximate unit if you're not unital um, to get this result. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take g to be ordered pairs n comma x where n is a normalizer and x is in d hat such that n star n, which is an element of D, so we can apply it to x, is not equal to zero. And we're going to um, uh, quotient this by a relation. And this is going to give us essentially a groupoid. Um, it's not exactly a groupoid, but um, uh, we'll pretend that it is for right now. Um, we can take this source of some n comma x is x, the range to be the, act the induced action of the normalizer on x. And then we think of n comma x as mapping x to n dot x. And we also get linear functionals on a this way. So epsilon of a of ordered pair is going to take a and maps to um, essentially the conditional of expectation of n star a at x and then normalized uh, so that it's a nice, um, it has norm one. So this equivalence relation here is just saying we're taking n x and, and m y, y to be equivalent if the linear functional we get is the same linear functional on a. So the theorem that Renault proves is that if we have a Carton embedding and G uh, is constructed like I've shown up here, this G ends up being a topologically principal at all groupoid. It's not exactly a groupoid, but we'll, um, uh, we'll uh, put that under the rug right now. Um, then if I take the C star algebra of this G Oh, I've got the order wrong here. Uh, the C star algebra, the group with C star algebra is isomorphic to A. And that isomorphism takes C zero of the unit space to the uh, abelian subalgebra. And moreover, this is unique. So if I have A comma D um, is presented as a groupoid C star algebra in another way, um, then that groupoid is isomorphic to the original um, G. Okay, it looks like I have somebody asking something in a, uh, in a chat. Um, so yeah, Mazia um, was just asking, is it, is it a twist? Twist, and, and the answer is yes, it is a twist. Okay, so if, if you know what a twist is, then that, that's what this is. Um, thank you. So I, I'm just trying to not get into the uh, the intricacies of twists. And I'm going to avoid things. Uh, I'm going to make my statement so I can avoid twists entirely. Um, but if you know about twists, um, you can replace everything that I'm saying with twists and it'll all go through. OK. So. Ooh. This tells us that groupoids are twists and uh, our Carton embeddings are intimately connected, that every, uh, that every Carton embedding gives us a twist and every twist gives us a Carton embedding. Okay. And moreover, if D is, uh, if it's a diagonal, then um, this uh, G that we get is, a, is topologically, or is actually principal. So now let's get into really the main result of this talk. So recall that each element of a groupoid gives a linear functional on uh, the groupoid C star algebra. So for a subalgebra of C star R of G, we can define a groupoid just by those elements of G such that they don't annihilate uh, B, so that there's some element of B that uh, the corresponding linear functional is non-zero. So our theorem is 
that if we take a second countable local compact Hausdorff at all groupoid and we take the map from B to this G of B, this gives a Galois correspondence between intermediate subalgebras with B carton and open subgroupoids of G that contain G0. And I should mention here that B is going to be isomorphic to the um, reduced groupoid C star algebra of G sub B. Yeah. So we have this nice um, correspondence between uh, intermediate carton subalgebras and um, op open subgroupoids. And so here's a quick sketch of the proof. We can construct H from B using normalizers as described by Renault on the previous slide. Um, H is a subgroupoid of G by the uniqueness statement that I mentioned. And then H is, you, by the definition of the topology, H is going to be open. And then we can show that H is isomorphic to this G of B. So it's, there's a lot of technical details here, but that's the basic uh, argument. So now the question is, we've, we know which ones, which C star algebras are um, Cartan between C zero of the unit space and C star R of G, but are all intermediate subalgebras actually Cartan? That was the question that we needed to start it off with. So the answer is no, and here's an example. So consider the action of Z on the closed disk given by irrational rotation. And I'm gonna take the groupoid to be Z cross D. So this action is free except for zero at zero. So it's topologically principal. And I'm gonna let U be the generating unitary in the um, cross product. I'm gonna let J be the set of functions on the disk such that f of zero is equal to zero. So this is a nice um, ideal in, the, in C of D. And then I'm gonna take uh, K to be um, J cross Z. So since Z is an exact group, K embeds into um, C of D cross Z, which then is a uh, quotient into C of D um, mod out by J cross Z. And C of D mod out by J, that's just the complex numbers by the definition of J. So this latter um, C star algebra is actually isomorphic to C of Z, which, or C star of Z, which is isomorphic to the continuous functions on the circle. And this is an exact um, sequence in the middle because Z is an exact group. So what we get is that the quotient of C of D cross Z mod K is isomorphic to C of T. And this quotient map actually takes U that generating unitary to um, Z. So now I'm gonna take Y to be the set of functions such that F of negative one is equal to F of one in the continuous functions on, on the circle. And I'm gonna take B to be the inverse image under the quotient map here of Y. And this is a subalgebra of C star R of G. Okay, now I claim that G sub B, the set of gamma and G such that the linear functional restricted to B is not zero is all of G. I'll do this in two steps. So we're gonna first assume that R is even. So if I look at U to the R, that's actually in B. Well, U to the R gets mapped to Z to the R. And since R is even, um, Z to the negative one is one, which is equal to Z of one. So for R even, I take this epsilon of R comma X of U of R, I get one. Now, if R is odd, U of R minus U of negative R is also in B. Okay. And now for R odd, the linear functional of R comma X of U of R minus U of negative R is also equal to one. So notice that these are all of my groupoid elements, R comma X are even or R comma X are odd. Those are 
every single thing that I've got here. So that gives me that every element of the groupoid has some element of B that it doesn't annihilate. So, the, so that this G sub B is all of G. So now B is not the whole um, cross product. So it, B is not equal to C star R of G of B. And so by the previous result, um, C of D subset of B is not Carton because otherwise B would have to equal C star R of G of B. So not every um, intermediate subalgebra is necessarily um, going to give us a Carton embedding. Okay, so going back to the Galois correspondence from the previous uh, slide, we can strengthen the result that we talked about um, before. That if we ha have a Carton inclusion, and suppose I have an intermediate subalgebra, if there's a conditional expectation, then we know that it's Carton. But we also know, so it looks like we have another question here. So Karen's asking, is, um, is it clear that C of B? Is it clear that C of B? Yeah, because, um, oh wait, is it clear? Yes. Because the only thing that's being affected here are going to be elements of um, the unitary group. Okay, so if I take so if I take a function in D, and I and I just uh, use that embedding into uh, R, then. Under this quotient map, this would be much easier if I could write. So, so sorry about that, Karen. Um, so let me, if I have a function in C of D, I can look at, let me try to do this annotation. This is always ugly. So I'm gonna take, what do I want? I'm gonna take a phi, in C of D. Okay. Now I can take phi of U zero. This is going to get mapped to, what is this going to be mapped to? Okay. Right. So this is going to be mapped to phi of zero times the identity, okay? Where the, this is the identity function, one as a function on C of T. And if I take, And I apply that since this is just a constant function, okay? It's at, that function at negative one is also equal to one. So this element is in Q inverse of Y. Okay. Are you with me now? Okay. Okay. Sorry. 
sorry that that took so long, but sometimes you have to write things down and it's, this is not the best way to do that. Okay, we're all right. Okay, so let's, uh, thank you for that question, Karen. So we're talking about, um, so we were back here, we're talking about a carton inclusion and we had B, um, inside that. And then we're going to suppose we have this conditional expectation on the B. We know from a previous result that C0 of G0 into B is a Carton inclusion. But also from another previous result, we know that we have such a continuous um, uh, expectation if and only if, um, OK. So we know that the map um, B to G sub B is a bijection from subalgebras um, to open subgroupoids. But since it has a continuous um, a conditional expectation, we also know that that subgroupoid is, is closed. So this bijection takes um, intermediate sub um, subalgebras with continuous. Uh, conditional expectations on the clope and subgroup weights of G that contain the unit space. And um, like I said, I already went through this um, proof essentially. So now let's talk about a little bit stronger results that we have when we restrict our attention to diagonals. Wait, um, Tristan, how much time do I have? Um, well, as much as you like, we've, we've been sort of fairly lax. You can be anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half. So. You're, okay. You're doing fine. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be done in an hour and a half. All right. So uh, if you if it was 50 minutes, I would stop here. But if uh, if you guys don't mind if I go at least another 10 minutes. No, no, no. Keep going. Okay. All right. So so let's talk about um, we can strengthen our results for that Galois correspondence um, because in the Galois correspondence we only we saw just now that not all intermediate subalgebras are necessarily Carton. And the question is, are there cases where they all, where all intermediate subalgebras are necessarily um, Carton? And it turns, it turns out that we need a couple of restrictions for this. The first is we need to look at C star diagonals. So um, remember this is where the groupoid is actually principal. Um, and so we're into this equivalence relation um, setup, which is also the setup that we had in the von Neumann algebra uh, results at the beginning. So let G be a locally compact Hausdorff a tall groupoid and H is a soap open subgroupoid. And we're gonna take A to be um, the reduced C star algebra of G. So I'm gonna let A sub H to be all of the elements in A that are annihilated by every element of G that is not in H. Okay, a lot of uh, um, knots in there. But the idea here is that C star, the reduced C star algebra of H is necessarily in A of H. Why? Because just using that embedding that we were talking about before that gives us the, that C star R of H can be embedded in C zero of H. And so the only elements that of G that don't annihilate C zero of H are those that are in H. So we do expect that this inclusion is strict in certain circumstances, but we do know that if we take an intermediate subalgebra with G et al in principle, so we're in the diagonal setting, we take G of B, and this is an open subgroupoid of G, then C star of G of B is going to be a sub set of B, a subalgebra of B, which is also going to be a, a subalgebra of A of G of B. So we have a series of inclusions 
And what our goal is going to be is to show that in certain circumstances that this A of G of B is isomorphic to C star of G of B. Yeah. Um, it's not always the case. And we do need diagonals here. The, this is kind of a technical um, theorem, but what diagonals allow us to do is to actually construct certain normalizers um, that we wouldn't be able to do uh, without the diagonals. So it's really important that we have G to be a tall in principle uh, in this result here. So in order to really get the full result, I need to uh, mention amenable groupoids, and I'm not going to talk about them a lot. Um, there is a lot to discuss with them. But a function H from G into C is a positive type if for all units and finite subsets, we have the, these matrices defined are positive. The reason why I care about these is a theorem that we found, it's probably um, elsewhere as well, but we found in a, uh, a book by Brown and Ozawa that if G is a locally compact Hausdorff a tall groupoid, then G is amenable if and only if there's a net of some bounded positive type functions in the continuous compactly supported functions on G that converge uniformly to one on compact subsets of G. So we, if we're amenable, we have these positive type functions. Um, we also know, and this is due to Takish, Takishi, I think is how you pronounce that from 2014, that if G is a locally compact Hausdorff a tall groupoid, then G is amenable if and only if the reduced groupoid C star algebra is nuclear. Yeah. So if we're in a situation where we have um, nuclear C star algebras, then we're gonna end up with amenable groupoids. Okay. So here's what we get with the extra assumption of amenable and also uh, the extra assumption of principle. If we have a locally compact Hausdorff amenable a tall groupoid and H, oh, we don't need, yeah, I don't think we need, and H is the open subgroupoid, then A of H is isomorphic to C star of H. So this brings us all the way around in that um, setting. I do think I need principle. So let H, I be our net of positive type functions in C, star, C of G that are given by amenability. We can define a multiplication operator uh, on C star of R of G by just taking a function and multiplying it by H I of F times F. So this is multiplication, not the convolution multiplication. And this is pointwise multiplication. Then, um, you can show that M, this multiplication operator times A of I converges to A of I for all A in C star R of G. Moreover, if I take an A in that A of H, then if I apply this multiplication operator, it's necessarily in the continuous compactly supported functions on H. Well, how do I know? Well, if I take A, it's annihilated for by everything that is outside of H. So its support is in H. And since HI is compactly supported, this MHI is a continuous compactly supported function on H. So that tells me that if I take the limit of these things, that has to be in C star R of H because each of the elements is in C star, reduced to C star algebra of H and A is in C star R of H. So we get that this, these two um, sets are equal and so they must be isomorphic. All right, so now this allows us to uh, prove one of the main theorems of the paper is that if we have an intermediate subalgebra of a principal um, amenable groupoid, 
then it is necessarily, then the embedding of D into that is necessarily diagonal. And the proof here is that we um, know that C star R of G of B is a subset of B, it's a subset of A of GB, which is equal to C star of GB. So we have equality throughout. And since uh, G is principal, so is G sub B. And so C star um, uh, G of B has C zero of G zero in it and it's principal. So therefore it is diagonal. So in the special case that we have an amenable uh, principal groupoid, then every intermediate subalgebra is um, diagonal. Now, we needed amenability um, to get that approximation argument. Um, I've, we think that amenability is necessary here. Um, uh, Rui had a um, conversation with Skandelis that seemed to suggest that he had a counterexample if, um, if we weren't in the amenable situation. Um, but I'm telling you everything that I know right now. So I don't know what this counterexample might even look like. Okay. So one consequence that I want to mention is for group actions. And I, I, I kind of like this result is that if we have a discrete amenable groupoid acting fr freely on a locally compact house or space X, then there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between intermediate subalgebras and open subgroupoids of X and G cross X. Now, one of the things that I really like about this result is that it says that even if we're interested only in cross products by groups, groupoids naturally show up. Um, and so it gives us a, another reason why we might be interested in groupoids, even if um, for whatever reason, we're not interested in groupoids already. So anyway, that's the last result I want to mention here. Um, thank you very much for your kind attention. That was great. That was a very nice talk. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. No, thank you. So uh, do you have any questions for John? Just uh, if you do, you can just unmute yourself. Yep. Oh, someone else? Okay, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, in your in the thing about the diagonals, I guess yeah. you have something for twisted groupoids, actually, not just groupoids. Yes. yes. In that case, uh, is there a notion for amenability of a twisted groupoid? Yes. Um, and it's it, honestly, let me. So. It's not too hard to see that this Brown Ozawa condition actually works for twisted the twisted case as well. Okay, so um, so you can use that and this Takish. Now I'm refer, referring to you this theorem by Taki Ishi. I'm sorry, I'm killing his name, and I apologize for that, um, but. That result is actually for um, twisted the twisted case as well. And is it enough? Okay, so if, if you have a twist over a groupoid, is it enough that the groupoid it's, is is amenable or is yes? Yeah. Um, because at that point you have an uh, since the group if G is the group, so what you have is now an exact sequence and a two out of three situation. Um, the circle cross the unit space is certainly amenable. Um, G is amenable. And then, so the middle part of that exact sequence is also going to be amenable. Um, and, that's, and that's a result by um, Renault and Claire in, um, uh, in their big tomb on uh, amenable groupoids. They have that two out of three 
Okay. So then also, I guess all these, all these uh, reduced uh, parts can be removed. Yes. As soon as we start assuming uh, amenability, we can remove the R's. I just didn't define the C star okay. algebras but without the R's, so I just left the R's in. Right, I just wasn't as sure what happens in the twist case, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. and I think your pronunciation wasn't so bad there. Ta Takaishi. Takaishi? Take, take, Takaishi. So you just pronounce every syllable, right? Takaishi. Yeah. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you, were, you were in Japan, right? That's that's right. Yeah, yeah. This is where I did like my my PhD. So yeah. <laughs> do you do you know him? Uh, no, I I never came across him. But uh, yeah, I mean, I left in two thousand twelve. So yeah, before this result. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I it seemed to be the, so. This seemed to be a PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So, um. Yeah, I. But but I don't know. So. <laughs> yeah. Do, do you know where? No, just somewhere in Japan. Um, no, I. It it wouldn't be hard because it I. He he thinks his advisor in it, and I I've and I and I'm blanking on what the what his advisor's name is, so I apologize. Yeah. Yeah, all right. <laughs> no, I and I sh I should mention that I'm using the pronoun, his here, and I'm not convinced that that's the. If that's the correct pronoun either. <laughs> so, I, I, I apologize for using that because I'm, I'm not sure. Yep. Okay. So, um, so if I understand your last, what, the last bit correctly, so there's, in general, you have the, the Galois correspondence, or yeah. Galois connection, I guess, between open subgroupoids and these, uh, yeah, the, the, the you know, Cartan, sub Cartan algebras or whatever, right? And, and, the, what you're saying at the end is that it actually becomes a true actual correspondence when you restrict to uh, amenable principal groupoids. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, and, you, and, and you're pretty sure you need amenable, but I guess you're you're probably sure you also need uh, principal as well. Right? Yeah, we're absolutely sure we need principal because I have that example that shows um, right. that it doesn't work um, if it's mm -hmm. not principal. Um, now, there's one. One thought there, that one has, what made that work is that uh, we have a quotient of the group boy, or the group that gives us um, a non-principal action. Right. Okay. And so if you're in a situation that is more like a condition K from graphs where, um, Every quotient is also, um, if you restrict to every closed set, um, you still get a topologically principal groupoid. I'm mm -hmm. not sure. Okay. So it, it, you may be able to take it a little bit further than principal. Right. It's still pretty good. But, yeah. but, um, but I'm not sure. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I have another question if I'm allowed. Yeah, please. Um, can you go back to this result that was uh, Cameron and Smith about the... Yep. Oh, that's, that's way, of the, way at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, I imagine obviously what they've done is quite different since there's probably no group boys yes. involved. Um, do you think that there's some way of somehow, if you were to take the notion of a non-commutative Cartan, uh, yeah, which is uh, defined by Rui, for example, right. uh, is there any way you could somehow sew these results together into one bigger picture? Uh, of maybe. Okay, uh, so that that's an interesting question. Um, uh, I, I, I've, and I haven't thought about it. Um, their, their methods are very different from ours. Um, and, and in fact, we, we tried to, uh, we tried to generalize their methods to start or apply their methods. Um, and 
they weren't working. Um, so it, the one question is, could we apply our methods to a case where the C star algebra isn't simple like they have here, right, for example. Um, and I honestly don't see why not, but I haven't gotten into the details either. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, uh, do you have any more questions? I have another question. Oh, yeah, please. Right. Okay, the results about diagonality and maneuverability. Can you go there? I uh, that you wanted to see the diagonals. Okay. okay. So, mm, so maybe yeah. a bit. Talking about here? After that, three? Oh, here. Okay. Okay, also this, uh, okay, you consider that the G is at an amenable and principal. Uh, but uh, how about if G is a twist? Because uh, usually this case uh, that the D is a subgroup of A, A should be like a reduced twisted group for it. Uh, so this is true for if G is a twisted group for it? Yes. So, so I'm stating this theorem differently than it's in the paper. Okay. Um, just so I didn't have to get into twists. But mm -hmm. the paper um, actually says um, Okay. Um, okay, that's all of diagonal I'm going to write. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, and um, we're also assuming nuclear. Yeah. And with those two things, we get that uh, the twist is amenable and um, over a principal groupoid. Uh-huh. Because usually to do this are not at a yes, yeah. So the uh, but but they're gonna be over in a tall group. Uh, okay. Um uh, okay. yeah, so the twist will never be at all because it has that extra circle part, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But um once we quotient out that circle part, we end up with an atal group word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh and uh Okay, and since D is also is a diagonal and also Cartan and B, and then also B is like a twisted group plate, CS algebra. And then there is yep. some relations between these, these two group plate, the twist that is between the Cartan of a D and B and the twist that is defined by the Cartan of a D of A. Yep. Yes. So um, the relation is exactly the one that I've um, indicated before. Um, this so is an open subgroup weight. If we're going to talk about twists, it's going to be open subgroup weight. So we have um, a twist, we have a sigma over uh, group void. Then I can take, um, and maybe I have this quotient map here. Okay. Then I can restrict to Q inverse GB. of GB. And so all I need to do is describe um, this part of it. Oh, okay. 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 And, and, explain you. Yeah, and then um, the whole twist is just you um, restrict to the inverse image. Oh, okay, thank okay. you. No problem. Thanks for the question.